May the Lord bless you this evening as you seek His face. And as we open the Word of God tonight, I want to begin with a word of prayer. Before I pray officially, I just want to say if you have a prayer request, please send them in and we will try to acknowledge them in our group prayers that we do together as a church ministry. Uh, we might not be able to get it live here on the feed unless you can type it right away, but we certainly want to acknowledge and uplift you in prayer. So what I'm going to do is just ask you to bow your head. I'm going to pray here, and then we're going to open up and continue our study in the book of Revelation. Thank you for your attention and time, and why don't we go ahead and pray together. Father in heaven, I just want to say thank you, Lord, for the privilege to seek you. Thank you for the privilege to study your word. Thank you for the blessing of the truth, because by taking hold of it, you have promised that we can be set free. Lord, I pray that you would reveal yourself in a marked way through your words, that we might behold Christ, that we might take hold of what he is offering to us, and that we might find a blessing therein. Thank you, O Lord, for this privilege. I pray thee in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I want to begin in the Bible in Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3, that's where we've been studying about the church of Laodicea. And we've kind of gone through each one of the lines very distinctly and brought out certain points. Certainly we haven't gone over every specific detail, but we've given some solid points through the scriptures that I believe have been an encouragement to those who have sought to apply them to their life. Now as we continue in this study, we find ourselves in verse 20. We talked about standing at the door and Christ knocking. We talked about if any man hearing his voice. We talked about opening the door. As a matter of fact, the last time that we were together, we shared the various accounts in the Bible to people whom had opened their door to Christ in the physical sense. And by doing so in the physical sense, they were blessed abundantly. And uh, how much more should we be opening the door of our hearts? And I just want to further those thoughts tonight. As we get into this, notice the last clause of verse 20. It says, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. I will sup with him and he with me. I want to take you to an account in the Bible. We've actually looked at this before many a times, but I believe that it is applicable even to this particular passage. Luke chapter 24 and notice what the Bible says here in Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. The Bible has this to say in Luke chapter 24 beginning in verse 13. Luke chapter 24 beginning in verse 13. The Bible says in verse 13 of Luke 24, Behold, two of them went the same day to a village called Emmaus which was from Jerusalem about three score furlongs. Just so that you know, that's about eight miles. So quite a bit of a, a walk there. It says, They talked together of all the things which had happened, and it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, notice who drew near, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But it says specifically in verse 16 that their eyes were holden that they should not know him. So they didn't recognize him, and it makes sense that they didn't recognize him because they were sad. It's possible that they were emotional and even crying on the way back. Mm -hmm. And as they're wiping their eyes and they're talking to one another and saying, I can't believe what just happened, because what just happened was that Christ was crucified that very weekend. And they didn't discern that, oh, lo and behold, the person that we... Saul being crucified is now with us right now. That It was just they weren't quite cognizant that Jesus himself had drawn near. And so Christ asked them a question in verse 17. What manner of communications are these that ye have one to another as ye walk and are sad? Now from verse 18, 
clear down to verse 24. Okay, and I'm not going to read all these verses. But from 18 to 24, they begin to respond to him. Just as an example, in verse 18, I'll read the first one. It says, And one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answering, said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem? And has not known the things which are come to pass there in these days? And then Christ said, What things? And then they go on to explain to him basically everything that had happened that weekend, as if he were a stranger. But then Christ begins to share with them something. Notice what it says here in verse 25. Christ said to them, O fools, verse 25, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. And notice this specific phrase here in verse 26. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into His glory? In other words, they had some misconceptions because they were sad about what had happened. When Christ came then to explain and He says, Are you guys slow of understanding that the scriptures, the prophets, said that this was going to happen? And He says, Ought not Christ to have suffered? Doesn't the scriptures teach that the Messiah was indeed going to give His life? as a ransom for the world. So then notice what Christ began to do for them in order to help them with their misunderstanding. In verse 27, it says, Beginning at Moses and all the prophets, He expounded unto them in all the what? Scriptures. The scriptures, the things concerning whom? Himself. Himself. So he began, as they are walking, remember, they're walking. This is eight miles. It takes a while to walk eight miles. And so here they are, walking this distance, and Jesus is explaining to them the prophecies from Moses all the way through, the certain things that pointed to himself, which was the Messiah, the certain things that pointed to the Messiah. Here are some possible things. We're not told exactly where he took them in the scripture, but the possible places, maybe he began in Genesis 3, verse 15, where it talks about the seed of the woman and that the serpent would bruise his heel, but he would crush the head of the serpent. Maybe he took them to the book of Numbers, Remember, he started in Moses, so Moses wrote Numbers. Maybe he took him to the book of Numbers and showed them the prophecy that Balaam had mentioned about a star rising in the east. Maybe he explained to them in Deuteronomy chapter 18 where it says that a prophet shall rise up among your people, him shall you hear. Maybe he took them to Isaiah and showed them specifically in Isaiah 53 that he was bruised for our iniquities, that he, his stripes, by His stripes we were healed. You know, upon Him was laid the iniquity of us all. Maybe He took them to these various passages of Scripture and tried to help them understand the prophecy. Now notice this. Verse 28. It says, They drew nigh unto the village whither they went. And he, notice this now, I want you to notice this. A lot of times we skip over this particular phrase, but I don't want to miss this phrase, verse 27. Sorry, verse 28. They drew nigh unto the village whither they went. And notice this. He made as though he would have gone further. What does that phrase mean to you? He, he, he began to, it made it seem like he was going to keep walking, like, okay, guys, nice talking to you. I'm just going to keep going this way. After he was explaining to them, I'm sure they're just thinking and thinking and thinking as he is explaining, and they're just like, wow, how come we didn't even discern these things? They're right here in the scriptures. Why didn't we discern them? And Christ is like, okay, guys, we're, we're, coming, 
We're coming to our destination here. You guys have a good night. It was good talking to you. He made as if he was going to walk further. But here's what they decided to do. Notice. Verse 29, but they did what? Constrained him, saying, no, 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 wait. Abide with us. Abide with us. Right, stay here. Wait, don't, don't leave. For it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to do what with them? See, the desire of their heart was to show you forgive me I'm waiting for the the truck with the muffler out there okay pardon uh, the neighborhood so here we see that they desired for Christ to remain with them please stay you know it's important to show hospitality imagine if they did not show hospitality they would have missed the blessing of having Christ in their home. We should always be willing to give hospitality to the people. And here it was late. They appreciated what he was sharing with them. And instead of letting him just leave, they said no. As a matter of fact, they kind of put the pressure on him. The Bible says they constrained him. Like, please, no, wait, please, stay with us. Abide with us. Now notice the result of, did Christ reject their hospitality? No. Mm -hmm. no. You see, we should give hospitality, but on the flip end, we should be willing to receive hospitality. If someone wants to do something nice for you, then allow them to do it. That's part of them being able to express the love that they have. And we should not often refuse hospitality, and likewise, on the other side, we should often give hospitality. So moving on from hospitality, notice verse 30. It came to pass as he sat at what with them? As he sat at meat with them. That's King James for saying, guess what? They had supper together. Right, they supped. And notice the result. He took bread, blessed it and break and he gave it to them now now check this out now you can see here i have my hand in my sleeve kind of right I, this is just my imagination i'm not saying this is what happened okay but in my imagination when i read this story here's his hand and when he goes to extend to give them the bread what did, might have they seen mm -hmm. yeah is it possible that they could have seen some scars see whether that was the case or not Somehow the Spirit of God opened their eyes. Notice verse 31. After it says that He blessed the bread and gave it to them, verse 31 says, Their eyes were opened and they what? They knew Him. Then it says that He vanished out of their sight. Verse 32 says, They said one to another, Did not our heart burn within us? While He talked with us, by the way, while he opened to us the what? The scriptures. the scriptures. Do you see? As they spent time in the Word with Christ, they began to know him and their hearts burned within them. I'm going to tell you how much their hearts were burning. Okay, hold your hand here. Hold your hand here. We're going to come back. Hold your hand. Go with me to the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah. And I want to take you to Jeremiah chapter 15. Jeremiah chapter 15. Okay, in Jeremiah chapter 15, notice what Jeremiah says here in verse number 16. Can someone read that out loud? Oh, go ahead. Thank you, brother. Thy words were found, and I did eat them. And thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. For I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. All right, notice now. He says, 
that I, thy words, he said, I ate them, right? And what was the result of Jeremiah eating those words? It says it became the what? The joy and rejoicing of my heart. The joy and rejoicing of my heart. Go, go forward to Jeremiah chapter 20. You're still in Jeremiah. Go forward to Jeremiah chapter 20. Remember, these gentlemen, their hearts burned within them. That's what it said. Did not our hearts burn within us? But notice now in verse number 9. So chapter 20 and verse 9. Can someone read that one? Then I said, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more of his name. But his word was in my heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones and I was weary with forbearing and I could not say all right so notice Jeremiah in his ministry he grew frustrated with the people and even though he grew frustrated with the people he said you know what I'm I'm not gonna say anything anymore I'm not gonna preach that's what it says there it says I will not make mention of him nor speak any more in his name I'm not gonna preach for God but <laughs> Even though he closed up his mouth and he decided, I'm not preaching anymore, what was there? Still was burning in his heart. The word was there. It was burning in his heart like a fire. He had to. He had to. And it says there, his word was in my heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones. Now, now let's go back to Luke 24. And I, and I want you to reconsider what these men. They had time communing with Christ, supping with Christ, having supper with Christ. And as a result, they said, did not our hearts burn within us? That's the result of having this communion with Christ. The Holy Spirit begins to work upon the heart. And notice here, remember when they told him in verse 29, go back to Luke 24 and verse 20, um, 29. Yeah, Luke 24 and verse 29. Remember the excuse that they gave him to why he should stay? They said, Abide with us, for it is toward the evening and the day is far spent. You remember that? Mm -hmm. So they were like, Hey, you know, it's getting late. You might as well stay here. Please stay with us. But check this out. After they said that, let's fast forward, verse 32. Again, after they said, Our heart burned within us. While he talked with us by the way, and while he opened to us the scriptures, notice what happened in verse 33. And they rose up the same hour, and where did they go? To Jerusalem. Back to Jerusalem. Now, how far did they walk? Verse 13. Right, it said there, it was three score furlongs, which is approximately eight miles. They were so excited about the truth. Forgetting the fact that the day was far spent and night was here. They, that same hour, they ran all the way back to Jerusalem. After they told him, stay with us because it's, it's already late. You know, it's late. We got we to gotta settle down for the night. No, this is how much on fire they were for Christ. Because they were willing to have supper with him. They were willing to have him abide with them. They were willing to be open to the truth of His Word. Do you know that if we have that same experience, that our hearts will be on fire too? Mm -hmm. That even if we get frustrated with the various ministries that we have to do, like Jeremiah, he was upset. He's like, I'm, I'm not going to preach anymore. But the Bible says that His Word was like a fire in His bones, and He had to preach it out. See, these individuals here show us the blessed experience to those who are willing to open the door and have Christ come in and sup with Him. Your hearts will begin to burn. You will have the joy and the rejoicing of your heart. Now, what's interesting to me as well is, let's take this now to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. There's 
there's no way that they could have gone to sleep knowing that Jesus was just with them. Right. <laughs> right. That's why they had to run back. They're just like, we can't. You got to tell everybody. <laughs> you got to tell the others. Right. They couldn't hold it. They couldn't hold it within. They had just seen Christ. Did not our hearts burn within us? They ran all the way back. Now, here in John chapter 6, kind of tying together a little bit of this principle and truth about communing with Christ, supping with Christ. In John chapter 6, Christ said this in verse 53. Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood, ye have no life in you. Verse 54, For whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood, notice what this says, dwelleth in me, and I what? And I in him. So if we want Christ to abide in us, what do we have to do according to this passage? Drink his blood, eat his flesh. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, this is symbolic. And even these individuals that were in this chapter had a problem with those expressions. They said, how could, how could he say that we can eat his blood and drink him? But he, they knew that he was being symbolic. They just didn't like the way that he was putting it. But he gives us some further indication in verse 63 what he's referring to. In verse 63 he says this, it is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh does what? It profiteth nothing. And then he says clearly, The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. You see, these words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. The words of God. As we are willing to accept the Word of God, drink His flesh, sorry, drink His blood, eat His flesh. You know that the blood, in Leviticus, it says that life mm -hmm. is in the blood. Leviticus 17 and verse 11, the life of the flesh is in the blood. And so this blood represents symbolically His life. He shed His blood so that we can live. Right. right. So that's why when, by receiving the blood, the bread represents the bread of life. In John chapter 6, that same chapter, go, back, go backwards to verse 48. Notice what He says, I am that bread of life. Now, this is something that Christ offered to his disciples another time. When did they have bread? The upper room. Right, in the upper room. Let me ask you a question, uh, Sister Ann, and all of us really. When did the upper room episode, you could say, when did that transpire? What was about to happen after that? Right, right before the crucifixion of Christ. So right before the crucifixion of Christ, Christ wanted to have supper with His disciples. Now, this is important, okay? This is important because if we consider this parallel, right? If we consider this parallel, Christ was on the verge of two great powers coming together. The religious power of the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees, the leaders of Jerusalem, and then the political power of Rome, like Pilate, like Herod. When those two powers came together, religious and political, 
church and state, when those two powers came together, Christ ended up crucified. So notice now, here's the parallel for us. Right before church and state comes together, what did Christ want to do with his disciples? He wanted to have supper with them. Mm -hmm. Do you see that? He wanted to have supper with them. And it's important to understand. Go to Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. All right, beginning in verse 14. Okay, verse 14 says, When the hour was come, he sat down and the twelve apostles with him. Now we're in chapter 22 of Luke in verse 15. Notice this now. And he said unto them, With desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before when? Right, before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. So notice here, right before Christ was to suffer, enter into that suffering, He had a desire to have this supper with His disciples. Church and state coming together, that was the suffering of Christ. But before He entered into that supper, He wanted to have supper with His disciples. What did he offer his disciples at that supper? Notice. Right, notice this. At the supper, verse uh, 20, I'm sorry, verse 19. What did he offer his disciples at the supper? Verse 19, it says, He took bread and gave thanks, break it, and he gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. This do what? In remembrance of me, verse 20. Likewise also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the what now? The New Testament in my blood which is shed for you. Give me another word for testament. Covenant. It's the New Covenant. Christ was offering the privilege of the New Covenant. That was the main purpose of this supper is to establish with His disciples a new covenant. Here is a service that I'm trying to give to you, I'm trying to offer you a new covenant. Now again, I'm going to paint this picture and then we start winding down here to the close. Church and state. They came together and it caused the suffering of Christ, crucifixion. Right before church and state came together, Christ wanted His church his disciples, to enter into this new covenant by eating the flesh and the blood. Likewise, the last church, Laodicea, we're the last church. Right before the mark of the beast crisis, right before the time of trouble is coming, right before church and state are going to come together, Christ also says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and do what? I will sup with him. Christ also wants to have supper with us. And at the the supper that Christ wants to have with us, what do you think he's going to offer to us, just like he offered to his church then? The privilege to enter into the covenant. The privilege to have his law written in our hearts. The privilege to have life. He says, whoever eats of my flesh and drinks of my blood shall have life. He's offering life to the church of Laodicea. He's offering the privilege to enter into that covenant with him, just like the parallel with his disciples. And notice now, if we show him the hospitality and open the door, because that's what it says, if any man hear my voice and open the door, if we show him the hospitality and open the door and say, abide with us, guess what? Our eyes will be open. He'll give us the eye salve that we might see. 
we will understand the scriptures so much so that our hearts will burn. We will receive the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit fell upon the disciples, it says that it came down with cloven tongues of what? Fire. 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 What else burns? Fire. Yeah. Right. So when those men allowed Christ in and they had supper with Him and He opened to them the Scriptures, it says their hearts burned. Likewise with us, we will receive the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We will receive that latter rain power to be able to go through the time of trouble. But it's being offered to us as a supper just like it was to the disciples right before Christ died. And so we have to say, Lord, abide with me. Our last text is John chapter 14. Go ahead, Anne. Um, what about the Last Supper before He was crucified? There was an evil spirit in with the disciples, Judas. Right. So he had to take care of that spirit right. before he was crucified, right? Right. I certainly appreciate you pointing that out. Because he would be crucified, then he would go to heaven. And if Judas was still alive, he was going to still have an influence on the rest of the disciples. That evil spirit would be working with the other disciples. Right, right. To distract them. I certainly appreciate you pointing that out. Um, it's important that we recognize that there has to be a work of purification. Not only when Christ says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, not only is it, um, it's not something that we look at as the whole church of Laodicea, but a church is simply a collection of individuals. And so on the individual level, Christ is knocking at the door of the heart. And He wants communion with us personally. He wants to spend time having that supper. He wants our personal hearts to be on fire. That was the problem with Judas. He never truly let the door open, so to speak, inside his heart. If Christ wasn't there, right. then Judas could, Satan could work. Right. Right. More fully. I've been in a room before with people and I can feel a bad spirit. Right. So it's, in, it's important then that on the personal level we are all seeking Christ. Notice here in John 14, our last text. Verse 23. Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep... What now? My words. Remember we said it is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. John 6, 63. So the words, he says here, He, if a man love me, he will keep, notice, my words and my father will love him. And we will come unto him and make what? We will make our abode. We will make our abode. Notice this in verse 15. If ye love me, do what? Keep my commandments. Keep my commandments. Now notice the result also, verse 16. I will pray the Father and he shall give you another comforter. That he may, notice this phrase, abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth in you, and shall be, notice this again, in you. Christ says, Behold, I stand at the door of knock. If any man hear my voice, and open the door, I will come into him, and will sup with him, and he with me. He will abide with us, but we have to open the door. We have to be willing to spend time with Christ. And if we open that door, our hearts will burn within him, within us. We will receive the Holy Spirit. We will be prepared at no matter what sacrifice to do all that we can to share the truth with others. And we will be prepared for the coming crisis. But unless we are willing to commune with Christ, 
The Bible says, Acquaint now thyself with him and be at peace. Job 22. The Bible says, Be still and know that I am God. Our eyes will be open and we will know him. Be still and know that I am God. We have to make sure, that's uh, Psalms 46. We have to make sure that we are willing to spend time with Christ. If we're not spending time with Christ, if all of our time is spent on everything else, whether it be seeking, surfing the internet, uh, talking to friends, shopping, working, whatever, it can be both positive or negative. Even if you're not doing, uh, you're not out there robbing banks. <laughs> You don't necessarily have to be doing negative things to neglect time with Christ. But here's the thing. We have to spend time with Christ. Amen. We have to spend time with Christ. Did, any, did anybody eat today? Mm -hmm. Amen. Did you have breakfast? Did you have lunch? Some people have dinner. If we're willing to make sure that our physical bodies have the nourishment that it needs by eating our breakfast, lunch, or dinner? Shall we not more feed our spiritual? Shall we not eat in order to have spiritual nourishment that our souls may not famish? That we can have enough energy to glorify God and to move forward? If we spend at least 30 minutes eating our breakfast every morning, shall we not also spend 30 minutes spending time with God feeding our souls? at least one hour a day. I think the more, the more blessing, but at least one hour a day, spend time in contemplating the life of Christ. At least an hour a day. If you don't have one hour in the morning, then give Him a half hour in the morning, half hour in the evening. But at minimum, give God one hour. Can you not watch for me just one hour? Is what Christ said to His disciples. Right after He had that supper is what He told Him. Can you not watch with me for one hour? So I encourage you, open the door of your heart and may the Lord come in and sup with you and you with Him. And you will find victory and overcoming power. By God's grace, we're going to finish up Laodicea the next time that we're together. But as for now, let's say a word of prayer as we conclude. Father in heaven, we thank you for this time that we can come together as a group and commune with you. You told us, forsake not the assembling of ourselves together. As we see the day approaching, O Lord, and so it's our privilege to come together, to study together, to encourage one another, and as we look to Christ, Lord, give us that new covenant experience. Write your laws within our hearts. May our hearts burn within us. Like Jeremiah, help us to have a fire that is within our bones, that we might share the truth with others. Be with our families. Be with us as we make our way to our various homes. Be with my brethren online who are watching. And thank you, O Lord. Thank you for your word that liveth and abideth forever. Please bless us. And to this end, we pray, we hope, and we believe in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 I want to say thank you to YouTube, Facebook, brethren. May the Lord abide with you as you open the door to your heart. And may He transform you so that your hearts burn from within for His name's honor and glory. God bless you. Maranatha.